Hello, and welcome to the launch of the 2020 Martha's Vineyard Author Series. My name is Sue Ellen Lazarus. I'm the founder and the director of the series. And also, I'm uh, the founder and director of the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival. It's been a long road to get here, but at the end of the day, we're very happy to be doing these virtual events. There are over 500 people joining us tonight from all over the country and indeed from all over the world. Going virtual has allowed people who could not make it to the island this summer to participate in the series and remain connected to the island. So a special welcome to you. And we've gained new followers. So it's a good outcome despite it all. Thank you all for joining. If you're having trouble with Crowdcast, we are live streaming on our Facebook and YouTube pages too. You can find the links to those pages on our website, mvbookfestival.com. Tonight, we are honored and delighted to have Sarah Broom, author of The Yellow House, join us from upstate New York. And we could not be more pleased to also have Thelma Golden moderating the discussion. Thelma will be joining us from New York City. Our next event is this Sunday, so just in three days, August 2nd, when Eric Larson speaks with Ingmar Tolls about his new best-selling book, The Splendid and the Vile. And on August 2nd, I'm sorry, August 9th, we'll have a discussion about the Supreme Court with four experts discussing the inner workings of the court from different perspectives. And finally, on August 13th, there will be discussion on the Black Lives Matter movement, and please save the date and we'll be getting you full details. You can purchase The Yellow House and indeed all of the books featured in the series through our local bookstore, Bunch of Grapes. Go to the Buy the Book button on your screen and you'll link directly to their site. Many thanks to our sponsor, The Vineyard Gazette, the island's award-winning newspaper, and to our parent organization, the Chilmark Town Affairs Council and their commitment to find programming for all ages. There's a little team of people behind the scenes doing the heavy lifting to make our events happening. happen. Valerie Rosenberg, our COO, and Annie Treitman, our event coordinator, do all of the many things that lead to successful events. Many thanks to them. And thanks to Vince for technical support and to Nanawi Vanderhoop and Evan Hall for our lovely opening music. The event is possible because of the support of many of you have made generous contributions. We are grateful for this support. If you've not already donated, please consider doing that by making a contribution tonight. The, no the donation button on your screen makes it easy. Your donations make these events possible and help keep the book festival next year free. And the book festival next year will indeed, fingers crossed, take place on August 7th and 8th, 2021. Please mark your calendars and schedule your vacation around that. Uh, Crowdcast has a number of features that allow us to interact with each other during the event. There's an ask a question button that allows you to ask a question, but it also allows you to vote on other people's questions. First look to see if someone else has asked a question that is similar to your question and click the up arrow to bring the question higher up on the list. And you'll also see a chat window on the right side of your screen. And here you can connect or comment, interact with other audience members throughout the event. If you find it distracting, you can hide this window by clicking the down arrow um, in the top right corner of the screen. The recording of this event will be available on our website you, so you can share it with your friends. And for the issue at hand, Tonight, we're just thrilled to have Sarah Broom discuss her memoir, The Yellow House, with Thelma Golden. Sarah Broom is an award-winning author and journalist. The Yellow House is her first book and received the 2019 National Book Award in nonfiction. It was one of President Obama's favorite books of 2019, and one of mine too, as well as one of the New York Times 10 best books of 2019. In 2016, 
Sarah received the prestigious Whiting Award for Creative Nonfiction, which allowed her to finish The Yellow House. She's a native New Orleanian. She's the youngest of 12 children, as you'll learn tonight, and she now lives in New York City. Thelma Golden is the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, the world's leading institution devoted to visual arts by artists of African descent. During her tenure, the museum has welcomed more than 45 outstanding artists to its signature artists in residence program, and a new home for the museum is under construction under her leadership. Ms. Golden serves on the board of the Barack Obama Foundation and is a recognized authority on contemporary art of artists of African descent and an active lecturer on contemporary art and culture. We're so pleased that Sarah and Thelma are able to join us this evening. Join me in welcoming them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue Ellen. Thank you to the entire Martha's Vineyard Book Festival team. This is a real honor to be here. Thank you to all of you who joined us tonight, but most particularly, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Thelma. Not just for being here tonight to be in conversation, but for this absolutely breathtakingly fantastic, amazing, amazing book, The Yellow House. Thank you. And there are so many things I want to talk to you about because everything about what this book is has gripped me. It's sort of, I've held it in my heart uh, since reading it and thrilled to have the moment to have a conversation with you. But I thought perhaps as a way to start, you might read something for us. Sure. I'll read from the beginning. From high up, 15,000 feet above where the aerial photographs are taken, 4121 Wilson Avenue, the address I know best, is a minuscule point, a scab of green, in satellite images shot from higher still, my former street dissolves into the toe of Louisiana's boot. From this vantage point, our address, now might size, would appear to sit in the Gulf of Mexico. Distance lends perspective, but it can also shade, misinterpret. From these great heights, my brother Carl would not be seen. Carl, who is also my brother Rabbit, sits his days and nights away at 4121 Wilson Avenue at least five times a week after working his maintenance job at NASA or when he is not fishing or near to the water where he loves to be. 4,015 days past the water beyond all new cycles known to man, still sits a skinny man in shorts, white socks pulled up to his kneecap, kneecaps, one gold picture frame, around his front tooth. Sometimes you can find Carl alone on our lot, poised on an ice chest searching the view as if for a sign, as if for a wonder, or else seated at a pecan-colored dining table with intricately carved legs holding court. The table where Carl sometimes sits is on the spot where our living room used to be but where instead of floor, there is green grass trying to grow. See Carl gesturing with a long arm if he feels like it, wearing dark shades, even if it is night. See Rabbit with his legs crossed at the ankle, a long-legged man, knotted up. I can see him there now, in my mind's eye, silent and holding a beer, babysitting ruins. But that is not his language or sentiment. He would never betray the yellow house like that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. What makes this volume so incredible is that it is so many things. It is a memoir of your life. Mm -hmm. It is the story of your family. It's a social history of a mm -hmm. very special place in this country, New Orleans, sure. but also a geographic analysis of mm -hmm. the way in which that city unfolds. But it's also the story of before Hurricane Katrina and after, right? Yeah. Yes. So can you tell us where this story begins for you? 
You know, it's interesting, Thelma, and I'm thinking about this a lot, but before I start, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here with you. I admire you and your work, and it really matters to me and to the world, so thank you. Well, thank you. Um, but I, I, many, many years before I was thinking of this book as The Yellow House, I wrote a sentence, which was, I, Sarah Monique, which is my full name, am a haunted house. And I wrote that line because I was trying to understand this yellow house I had grew up in that I was basically obsessed with, you know. Friends would joke and say, you're talking about this house like it's a national monument, right? And I was like, it is a national monument in my head. And so I wanted to think about, and you'll understand this, I, you know, if you imagine the work of Whitfield Lavelle, mm -hmm. Know, those charcoal pictures of people on the walls. And, mm -hmm. and that's how I feel about place, that mm -hmm. somehow inscribed on the wall mm -hmm. within all the layers, right, mm -hmm. of renovation and reconstruction are these people who have things to say, these histories. Yes. And, and so that's where I began, just a little bit obsessed with the actual structure, thinking about architecture and thinking about the windows of the house and the views from the house and what it was like to grow up in this really humid sort of cranky town, mm -hmm. you know, and what that, what that sort of might tell me about why I became the person I am. Mm -hmm. And I think later it developed into so many more things. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems that the only way we can begin to talk about the person that you are, and I'm being careful because I am looking at the chat and there are so many people here <laughs> who say that this book, which we have to say again, congratulations for the National Book Award. This Thank book you. is now out in paperback, but there are many people in the chat who are reading the book now okay. and are getting ready for it to be their book club selection. So okay. we are not going to engage in too many spoilers no. because what a gift of this book is the way in which the story unfolds. So I want everyone who has not read it to have the same journey um, mm -hmm. that those of us who have. But I do think it's important to talk about the fact that this story of this house, this yellow house, is really the story of your family, which is a story mm -hmm. that you begin with your grandmother, Amelia. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about Amelia? You know, I had no choice. My grandmother was speaking from beyond. Mm -hmm. And I realized that to tell her story would be a way to talk about inheritance, would be a way to talk about how I was raised in this very matriarchal world, mm -hmm. where the women took on different names. They formed communities in the city of New Orleans and renamed themselves so that they all went by whatever name they chose. And, and, and the power of that, and my grandmother was someone who always yearned for a home. You know, she really bought into that American idea, the narrative that home ownership is the thing that makes you an American citizen. Mm -hmm. And she wanted this badly. But in the meantime, every place she rented, you know, she moved in and the walls were painted the day she moved in. And I, I tried to think about this as a way of her essentially claiming a space for herself mm -hmm. when she felt immensely unmoored, mm -hmm. you know, in the world. And, and to think about what a place represents for someone who feels displaced, who feels that they are outside of a narrative being told about a place that they love. Um, and so my grandmother, as this woman who created a world for herself and for her children, is a sort of being in the book, right? Mm -hmm. It feels like she's holding up yes. the structure of the book itself. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I know you all called her Lolo, and it yeah. feels like Lolo is throughout your book. Yes. But also, really, this is the story of your parents. Ivory May and Simon Groom. Mm -hmm. And it really is through their union that you are one of 12 children. And I feel I want to call all of their names, Simon Jr. <laughs> That's great. Deborah, Valeria, Lynette, Karen, Byron, Eddie, Michael, Daryl, Carl, and Troy. 
that you know that's amazing that you called their names i think i think that what's so interesting is while this book is often described as your memoir i think what you did the gift here is that you told the story of your family but through the very particular and profoundly to me powerful story of these individuals your siblings and the bonds that created family that become clear to us in the pre and post Katrina moment, right? As we have to understand these bonds, not in the space of the yellow house, but in the world. In the so, world. Can you talk about you, the youngest, right? Telling the story um, of, about your siblings and your parents and this incredible mm -hmm. family that you are from. Well, you know, it's interesting because my mother bought this yellow house when she was 19 with every penny she had and sort of proceeded to build a world in this place. And it was a place that grew us. And, you know, I don't know how many people in the room, the virtual room, mm -hmm. have multiple siblings. But, you know, siblings carry, the. they tell you who you are. You know, my siblings, in a way, tell me the history of myself, right? Mm -hmm. If I can listen. And, and they also butt up against me and they're also confrontational. And, you know, one of the things that I had a really hard time doing in the book, which I would like to do at some other point, was to really represent what the sound is. Mm -hmm. A long table full of 12 humans mm -hmm. telling, uh, competitive versions of the same story and talking over each other. And so it was a world of storytelling and this sort of joy and this idea that narrative really, really mattered, the stories you were telling. And I think I felt quite privileged in that world, but that also made me feel so much so, Thelma, that I was transgressing when I was writing this book in particular, because I, I kept asking myself, you know, you're the youngest. What do you actually know? Mm -hmm. right? how, how dare you think mm -hmm. that this is your story to tell? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think, in fact, my position as the babyest of these uh, other 11 brothers and sisters gave me the right, in fact, mm -hmm. to tell the story, you know, the way that I did. Yes. And it seems the way in which that manifests itself very beautifully is in the relationship between you and your mother, Ivory May. Yeah. You say, you write, I was just going to say, you write, my mother was, I can see now, the house that was safe. But even still, we carried the weight of the actual house around in our bodies. And it seems there at that line is when I understood the story you were telling. Mm -hmm. was one of this physical space, but of the space she created for you all in the world. It seems that for your mother, mothering was a radical act of mm -hmm. faith and determination. Mm -hmm. And it feels that, that that is there in the story of all of you, but in the house itself. Sure. I think, I think that's true. And, you know, I mean, you know, that it is so hard to really push beyond seeing your mother as your mother. Mm -hmm. and, and what was world changing for me was to experience my mother in the reporting of this book, mm -hmm. just as a woman, mm -hmm. a woman who made a set of choices, a woman who had certain desire, a woman who had interest in things beyond us even. And one of the things about my mother is that she's an artist. And I think nonstop about the um, Alice Walker essay, yes. in Search of Our Mother's yes. Gardens, I think so much about what would have happened mm -hmm. if my mother were allowed in a way to be a poet, mm -hmm. or if my mother were one of the quilters, or I think she has that essence in her. And I think the house, which I describe as the 13th and most unruly child, became a thing that she was bent on taming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of, not to give anything away, but part of what I think makes me who I am is what happens when I come to feel that the house somehow stands in 
for who we are, that the house has to somehow speak for who we are, that mm -hmm. I, in essence, gain this shame. Mm -hmm. And the shame, as shame will do, mm. becomes not only about the house itself, mm -hmm. but, but that I have shame in the thing my mother has made. And that, for me, is the thing that we can all connect to, right? Yeah. Sort of like yeah. insipid nature of shame mm -hmm. that it creeps and crawls mm -hmm. and moves from one maybe logical realm to all the illogical realms inside mm -hmm. of us, you know? Yeah. yeah, so beautifully put. Now, I want to talk about New Orleans, where mm -hmm. you were from, and that you capture also in all mm -hmm. of its complexity here. You know, in the book, your brother Eddie says, New Orleans is a mentality. What does that mean? <laughs> I think, you know, it, it's that's such an interesting thing for my brother Eddie to say, because I think, I do feel that New Orleans is the kind of place that people feel their way through. You know, it's the kind of place when you ask someone, what do you really love about it? Yes, they have the food and music and all that, but it's also feeling. It's this great, I think, city of feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to buy into it in a way, as you do in any big city that has its myth. I mean, mm -hmm. as Harlemites and New York City people and New Yorkers, right? We, we, we have our share of buying into certain mythologies about you know, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, which may be true, but we also know it's more idea for many people than actuality. And so I think it's the kind of place you really, you buy into or you don't, mm -hmm. you know? And, and the moment you don't, you maybe start to see these sorts of underbellies and layers mm -hmm. that, that before were a bit hidden to you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it is it is a mentality, but coming from where I come from, it's it's not a place of most people's imagination. You know, it's like, you know, Bay Bay boiling crawfish in the backyard, mm -hmm. and all of us with our plastic platters lining up to get some, right? So so how do you sort of embody a place and push the reader to go beyond this understanding? and mythology to someplace else. Right, right, right. Moving beyond this projection into a reality. Sure. But also very specifically, you map a geography in, mm -hmm. in, in the book. And at several moments, you talk about driving around the city, uh, taking the bus around the city, mm -hmm. and uh, riding your bicycle with your brother around mm -hmm. the city. And in that geography, you talk very sp specifically, and you give a beautiful specificity to New Orleans East. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about that distinction and the, and the uniqueness of, of sure. that neighborhood? Sure, so New Orleans East is an intriguing place for me. Mm. And I felt in this work that I wanted to say so much more, but there was only so much space. Mm -hmm. And what defines it for me is the way in which it's in fact so large, right? In terms of square footage, it is sort of massive in comparison to the city. It's also geographically quite cut off, and bounded by a lot of bodies of water, but you have to go over the high rise to arrive in New Orleans East. And so you have this feeling when you come there that you have left New Orleans somehow and arrived someplace else. The terrain does not induce the feelings that one gets walking down Royal Street or in the Garden District. There are no bands in the street. There are no lamp lights. It's flat and the houses are a little less interesting, more suburban, right? Mm -hmm. but, but historically, it was home and is home to this day to NASA, one of the largest sort of NASA plants. And so quite literally, it was the place where the, the sort of trips to space, the, the exploration of space was made possible. And I find it completely intriguing mm -hmm. that the rocket boosters were built in New Orleans East, right? Um, and, and were the thing that actually allowed these shuttles to, to sort of get into the others of space. And, but New Orleans East became, after the oil boom, a completely abandoned place. So with a lot of geography, people spaced out 
and no services really. It, it went from being a kind of dream of a new frontier for the city of New Orleans to being essentially an embarrassment to the point where, you know, people have called it the land of no return and they've called it the wild, wild east. And, you know, in general, I think of that as a form of name calling. Mm -hmm. that people essentially engage in name calling when it comes to the East. And you know, that really hurts my feelings mm -hmm. because that's the place I'm from. That's right, right. And, and the place that claims a lot of your imagination around this sense sure. of home, right? Yes. And, and the, the, the rootedness of the land itself, the address and the place where the yellow house lived. You, it, your trajectory has taken you from New Orleans and back, right? It seems to always call you back. And in many of those manifestations, it also was your path to becoming a writer. So can you talk a little bit about how you came to your work, to your practice, to your art? Mm -hmm. I love that question. I think I'm thinking so much about texture, about mm -hmm. soil, mm -hmm. about literally the soil that grows us as human beings. And if we're paying attention to the ground and to the land, what, what we can kind of learn from that. I feel that so much of who I am was made and constructed by the geography where I was born, which is to say I grew up on a cutoff end of a really long street. And, and there was persistent danger in this way of coming up. Mm -hmm. Because to get to my elementary school was Jefferson Davis Elementary. And to get there, you had to cross a massive raging highway. To get to Swegman's Superstore, to the grocery store, you had to cross a highway to get to church, to get to the post office, to get to the places that made our life. Mm -hmm. You had to consistently take those risks. And I think that when we, I go back and think about it, I think, well, who, who lives on that side of the street? And why is it that that those specific people are required to risk so much on a daily basis? And of course you become an adult and you think about things like zoning and public policy and planning, right? And city planning commissions. And you start to wonder what were the lapses in judgment when it came to this? Why, when I was growing up, was there a dump truck uh, place right across the street from the houses? And so I think the geography of that, the feeling that somehow I was a New Orleanian, but, but I didn't feel as connected as some others did. I felt somehow that people weren't paying that much attention to the short end of the long street where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I, I marvel to remember that I actually survived. And that is the realest point for me, that I find it unjust and a great tragedy mm -hmm. that there have to be survivors in this story. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and I'm one of them. So all of that, I think, formed me into this person who paid a lot of attention, Thelma, to the intersections of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the intersection here, of course, in your story is about race and it's about class mm -hmm. and it's about ownership and it's about wealth, right? Sure. And, and how, what we are able um, to gain and what inheritance can be. And it seems interwoven into the story about your family are those ideas and you That's give us exactly a right. way to understand them and with such precision. Um, that it's really a gift. Thank you. Now, clearly, at the center of the story is Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, you allow us. Um, it's perhaps in this story, the place at which you become a reporter. Mm -hmm. You are allowing us to understand the story of your own family's mm -hmm. displacement as a way to understand, um, in very personal ways, the displacement of so mm -hmm. many. Can you talk about what the sort of pre and post Katrina sensibility for your family uh, was and has been as you continue to reckon with what that has meant. 
You know, it's so interesting because I, I'm still processing and thinking about this because so much of what the world saw mm -hmm. after Katrina were the things we already knew. And I think, you know, growing up and over the years, you hear about Camille, Hurricane Camille and Betsy and all of the ways in which people have a narrowly escaped their li escaped with their lives. Mm -hmm. And you realize how precarious the whole thing is. I feel like Katrina was the moment where a bunch of people who weren't paying attention finally woke up and said, oh my God, this is what's happening in an American city that we love so much. And, and I think that was useful insofar as, you know, those people are valid and deserve to be seen but what I wonder so much about, because, you know, that was part of why I situate Katrina in the book as I do, which is not at the beginning and not at the very end, but sort of in the middle, you know, it has its own movement. And the idea is that in order to understand what was lost and what was gained in this one moment, you have to understand all these worlds before. And you have to also know that exactly 40 years before this moment, all these Betsy came and all of these promises were made and so much was supposed to get done that never got done. And, and we start to see the ways in which these insidious behaviors just keep coming back, mm -hmm. right? And we're living perhaps in another of those moments right. where we say, mm -hmm. oh, again, again, right? It's all on the surface for us to see. And the question I think is the same. So then now what? Mm -hmm. What will we do with the thing that we know? And mm -hmm. and Katrina was important for me to, to put in context, Thelma, because I was really upset at the way in which it came to represent everything about what it meant to be from New Orleans. And, and I just felt that that absence of context mm -hmm. about something that is age old about this country mm -hmm. needed there needed to be a correction to the record, right? And that's, I think, what writing is also about. Right, right. And I think in particular memoir, and very particularly African-American memoir, is a pol political act, right? Mm -hmm. Of telling these stories mm -hmm. that are not going to be told or correcting the stories mm -hmm. as they are often told. Mm -hmm. So there is so, there are so many evidences of influence in this book around your own sense of being a writer. You give us at many moments beautiful quotations from James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, Adrian Rich. You know, it, it goes on and on. There seems in there a way for us to understand your reading life. Can you talk about some of the writers that have had an influence on you and or what you are reading or have read that mm. helped inform your sense of yourself as a writer. Oh, I love that. You know, I really wanted to make it clear in this book, so I don't have a bibliography or an index or anything like that, but I felt that my bibliography were all of these epigraphs and the writers I talk about because I live with writers. They are my accompaniment. Mm -hmm. They are my shoring up. Mm -hmm. I think of, I could never say a favorite writer because that all changes depending on what it is I need. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand that what writers are doing is that work of being in conversation with a, a firmament of other writers mm -hmm. and also accompanying people whose names they don't yet know. And mm -hmm. so for me, that James Baldwin, I went around the world essentially looking for just and i feel so i mean you having been taught by jimmy baldwin and i went to umass amherst by the way mm -hmm. trying to you know i was a little too late mm -hmm. I, I you know i did the mm -hmm. same for june jordan i went to uc berkeley's journalism school for my master's just to be in June Jordan's Poetry for the People class. And she actually died of breast cancer mm -hmm. the summer before I entered. I still took her class, Poetry for the People, and it changed my life forever. Mm -hmm. And so June Jordan and Jimmy Baldwin, and, and right now I'm rereading 
Lucille Clifton, mm -hmm. and I'm rereading yeah. Tony Kate Bambara, and I'm rereading Gail Jones, and um, I love W.G. Zabold. I love Italo Calvino. I love um, uh, Elizabeth Hardwick. Mm -hmm. I love Marilyn Robinson, right? And so Toni Morrison, Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. um, who is who I am maybe inside of, I want to say, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that I'm nothing without these voices. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering, I'm always wondering how they did what they did and how I might just like get some of it by osmosis. And mm -hmm. I think now thinking about writers like Jasmine Ward, mm -hmm. um, who I love and revere and Kiesi Lehman and Imani Perry. And mm -hmm. I'm just so proud to be in this world with Sadia Hartman. Mm -hmm. I, I am um, really proud to be in this world with Isabel Wilkerson and all of these incredible writers, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the image of when you took your trip to go live and work in Burundi and waited for your books to come. <laughs> the idea that that was the piece of home yeah. that was coming with you. You know, a real thread through this um, book, through your words, is of course the sense of, the full sense of a life. Mm. But a, a light motif through it is one of beauty, right? Mm -hmm. Your grandmother's sort of love of beauty, your mother's sense of beauty, your mother's sense of imagination around mm -hmm. vision, space as she would want it to be, yes. that then comes out in your writing in the absolutely beautifully sort of picturesque way in which you form a vocabulary that gives us this sense of place mm. and moment. Can you talk about the role of beauty in your understanding of both the place you are from, but also the way that you see the world? You know, I, um, beauty is so important to me because I think Thelma, I was a blind child for so long until I was 10 and I got my granny glasses. But up until then, I just couldn't see a thing. And I think, you know, when you don't have something, when you have it, you really have it. Mm -hmm. And when I gained sight, I was like, everything looks great. Mm -hmm. and, and my mother, the particularity of her choices within a single room when, when we had nothing, less than nothing, in terms of material things. We had a lot mm -hmm. of joy and other things. But mm -hmm. I learned that beauty is about seeing, that, that you have to train your eye on something. And if you actually do that long enough, almost anything can gain beauty. Mm -hmm. It's like a patient endeavor, really. Mm -hmm. And how even in these dark days, how a, seeing a small, beautiful thing can like transfix the insides, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I have this utmost reverence for finding beauty. It's like a journey to find beauty mm -hmm. and to sometimes see what others don't see as beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think it's underrated, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we sometimes confuse trends with beauty. And, and also what it takes to call something beautiful when no one else is. Mm -hmm. And I, I think about this a lot when, I, when we think about New Orleans and the Tignon, the head wrap. Mm -hmm. And that these women, we, you know, were not legally allowed to show their hair. And so their version of beauty was, sure, I'll wear a head wrap, but I'm gonna make it the most beautiful, most interesting and individual thing you've ever seen in your life. And, and I think that's also the genius of black people and has been the genius of black people throughout time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the power in the ingenuity and so the creativity probably. that is in answer to so much, but then create something wholly significant sure. out, out of that. 
You know, yeah. I think that is at core, maybe the aesthetic principle, right? That defines the culture in so many ways. So I have to ask you about this moment and what's inspiring you as you navigate, as we all are, right? The complexities of this moment. Where are you as an artist finding inspiration? I mean, I know as a curator and someone who has been able to spend my life in the space created by artists, that artists are the people who help me and I think others see and understand. Um, you tell our stories, you give us a, a way to reflect. So how are you being inspired? Where are you finding a sense of inspiration in this moment? Oh, I love that. I, it's been so wonderful to connect with the young people in my family in this moment. Some of them are marching, some of them are having total life crises, but to hear the ideas they have about the world we should be living in, mm -hmm. to be a listener, to be an observer of their faces mm -hmm. by Zoom, to, to tune in, and then just feel at the end of it that this is why I create, this is why I love the blank page so much, right? And in, in the garden, when you go in the garden and you see how in the world did that thing bloom in the middle of all this, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's something to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, I'm thinking of myself as one in a long line of people, right? who have been through varying degrees of treacherous things. And I see myself now as an observer and a listener, and that somehow inside of me, there are all of these creative things budding and blooming. Um, if I just let them, mm -hmm. which is part of it, right? Yeah. Just mm -hmm. sort of letting them. Right, a allowing that process Allowing. To happen. allowing. Yeah. Well, I'm eager to get to questions, but before we do that, Sarah, I'm gonna ask you just to read uh, one more time for us, and okay. then we'll go to questions from the audience. Thank you. I'll just read a paragraph, a mm -hmm. short paragraph, which is about my grandmother, uh, Lolo. A yellow school bus full of ailing nursing home patients made its way down the highway. Which highway? Van Gogh said yellow is the color of divine clarity. Was grandmother sitting on a seat? Was it plush? Was it fake leather like on school buses where when you sit the air releases? Or was she lying on pillows on the floor? What of her arthritic knees? Were they hurting at all? Did she say a single word? Did she sing like normal? Did she look around? Did she have a flash of clarity? That is the thing I want to know. Did she have a moment of lucidity in her Alzheimer's ridden mind. Can the body feel the crossing of a state line even if the mind does not grasp? Was grandmother's forgetfulness like drinking from the river leaf? Did it cast her into oblivion, I wonder? Erase the landscape of her former life? And is this the only condition, this unknowing, under which one should cross over state lines, leaving your familiarity behind? Is this the only way to properly leave home? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm opening up the questions and I am going to read this just so I get it correct. And the question says, Sarah, I loved your line. I did not yet understand the psychic cost of defining oneself by the place where you are from. I grapple a lot with the good and not so great parts of my identity, and I find I can tie back to growing up on the vineyard. I'm wondering how you feel about the psychic cost now, and what is it like to know the cost and also have to spend a lot of time talking about and getting recognition for a book which is all about where you are from? Wow. That's like uh, an entire lecture. It, that it is. I it love is. Um, you know, it's useful to remember that I wrote that line because it's something I think I sink into a lot to define oneself 
the psychic cost, learning the psychic cost of defining oneself by where you're from. And there is a cost because when we allow something, which is a person or a structure or a place to stand in for who we are, to essentially speak for who we are, right? We, we I think, rob ourselves of a certain amount of power um, and and I think that no place, no other object, no mythology, no sign or symbol can stand in for the human being. And so much of my mother's angst, for instance, had to do with trying to control something which actually was out of her control. On the day she moved in, the ground was subsiding. Mm -hmm. It was beyond her, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think even when we think about the country we live in, we need to be thinking about how much of this, right, is 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 the underbelly, the the terrible truth of this place, right? And and I am made in this place, but I am also so much more than it, right? And so I think it's a challenge for me, for all of us, as we try to imagine how we make ourselves in this moment, which is a devastating moment. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Thank you for that. Um, Here's another question that says, family legacy is so important to me, to you, to so many people. It was so interesting to read about your family and your personal experiences. Thank you for doing so. You shared something of great value to the reader through your family. Was there a part of the book that was harder for you to share than others and why? I think the, the difficult nature of writing about my siblings because they are private people. None of them asked to have a nosy right. little sister telling all their business. And mm -hmm. what I tried to do craft wise was if I imagined this book as a kind of autobiography of a house. Mm -hmm. And you know, this house was essentially an observer of us in all of our lives. Then, then I need to tell certain stories, right? Because they illuminate the world of this place. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I think that's why I chose to do these oral histories. So I have hundreds of hours of videotape of my mm -hmm. family. And I think, Thelma, mm -hmm. that interaction, that way that I sort of became a participant observer in a way, it was, mm -hmm. I think, more anthropological than journalistic, gave me a freedom because my family told me these things. Mm -hmm. it was it was still mm -hmm. hard it was i was having nightmares you know eight months after the thing was was out and mm -hmm. in because i think it's hard to talk about people who are alive right you know right. in an honest way right and and to be an observer while you are a, a, part sure. a participant right in your family's sure. life yes. the next question is someone related and it says as someone who is part of a large family it can be tough to protect your energy and sometimes setting boundaries can come across as hurtful or disrespectful especially in families of color is, mm -hmm. is this something you have dealt with and how do you protect your energy when it comes to family and i would just add to that how did you carry what seemed to be all of these stories that your family gave you in um, in such um, an amazing way through the oral histories that were part um, of the book and that you show mm -hmm. us in some places where you transcribe directly from mm -hmm. their words. So how did I sort of carry this? And, yeah, I mean, it seems I, it's about care. And I, you know, and I think what we care. feel is, we feel the care. We feel the care and the love, but how did you protect that space as you were writing? You know, there were confusing moments because for instance, in the beginning, I wanted to transcribe most of the interviews so that I could gain like my family's rhythm. I wanted to like hear my brother Carl talking for a long time. So I thought it would help me sort of craft the book um, and understand cadence a little better and, and just language. Mm -hmm. But there was a time where I stopped talking to my family, the actual people in my family, because mm -hmm. in a way I felt I was talking with them. You know, mm -hmm. they were in my ear every day for a single year. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it was hard sometimes to know how to be in relationship with them because 
there were things I needed to do as a writer. I needed to make these people using this mountain of truth. They needed to become characters. They, they couldn't be Carl, you know, yapping about, you know, his last fishing expedition. <laughs> you know, I, I, this thing has to be compelling and interesting. And, mm -hmm. and I think the task was so big to make these humans who I know to gain the distance Mm -hmm. to make them into interesting, the interesting people they are, right? Mm -hmm. But using raw material. Yeah. And I think protecting my own spirit was about stopping mm -hmm. every time it became too much. Mm -hmm. Just quitting for the day, mm -hmm. starting again the next day, not overdoing it, right. you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, there's a wonderful question that um, asked if you will ever you imagine you will ever live in new orleans again and i that question resonated for me because of course we share harlem yeah yes. and another complex geography right yes. that um has been so captured by so many writers right generations and generations yeah. but it's yeah. still elusive right what, it is. what yeah. harlem is, is is transforming and you in several ways capture baldwin's words about harlem but uh, others as well. But do you think you will ever live in New Orleans again? What what would make that happen for you? So I don't know that I would live. I have a little place in New Orleans that I go mm -hmm. to that is my special. It's less special now because I did apartment therapy. So <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it's uh, sort of out there now. But right. I, it's still my special place. And before mm -hmm. COVID, I was going once a month. I think it's very hard to have lived in Harlem for so long and then live in New Orleans because suddenly I feel like I'm back in like my Burundian village somehow because everyone knows everything and the neighbor knows, you know, when you came in and when you're leaving. And so I think I like both worlds and I want to experiment with this form of being that one has many places. And I, I will never, ever let go of New Orleans. It's, it's my spot. Yeah. in the world, you know, but Harlem is also my spot. And I think mm -hmm. that's because there are so many Southerners yes. in Harlem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it feels like some form of being in New Orleans. Yes. Yeah. Right. No, certainly. And there's another question that asks if you are missing um, the Yellow House during quarantine. And one of the profound thoughts I had during while reading and then rereading your book was how much you create a picture of this house in all of its details. By the end of it, I had a sense of how the rooms laid out and the particular details. And you just spoke of having this time now with your the young people in your life, and I'm guessing some of them are your nieces and nephews. And am I right that you yes. have 50, 50, About 50, five, about five, 50 five zero. Five zero, zero. Yeah. yes. And it seems to me that's the gift as well, right? You create a visual memory. So are you missing? The, the yellow house in this moment um, more or less than you have in the past? I'm really missing my mother. Mm. I'm missing the sounds of my brother. What I'm learning, and, and I think this is a, an interesting idea for me, and it's new, is that how home becomes sensory for you, how home becomes the sound of something or the temperature or the smell of something. Mm -hmm. I'm missing pots cooking. I'm missing white beans on the stove mm -hmm. as a feeling of home. I'm missing what it feels like to be surrounded mm -hmm. by so many people who know your name. I'm really feel like missing this, my mother especially. And my mother sends pictures of sitting on her back porch and my siblings at a great distance with masks on. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I think I'm yearning for for that kind of closeness. Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there's a question, and I think this might be our last question, that says that there are 555 people registered. Um, oh wow! Listening to us tonight. And so why do you think that this book has resonated so deeply? And can you talk about the experience of having been in the world with this book you know, over this time and what you've learned from that? Well, I am 
just beyond thankful, Thelma. I still have this out of body experience about it where I can't quite believe how this book just becomes every reader's story in some interesting way. And it's sort of strange to see it going around because, you know, when you make it, you have all these ideas for it and, oh, it's going to talk, speak to this and that thing. And then you see it becoming more than you could have imagined and sometimes less than you imagined, which is okay too. Yes. And yes. I think, honestly, speaking from a personal level, what I'm most thankful for beyond the readers is that I got to talk about place and geography. Okay. It actually transported me to the other side of things so that as a writer, I could be on to the next one. And that, I'm telling you, that doing the first thing, no, I, I feel like more people should talk about this, mm -hmm. but just what happened psychically to you. Mm -hmm. And what did that feel like? You know, I mean, I think we also have to say this is your first book and that in itself is an achievement, right? That yeah. you, you worked on this book. Tell us how long were you writing? This so book. literally about 10 years, like from the time I got the book deal, but I had been thinking about it for mm -hmm. like 20 or something. But um, that that thing that happens when it's out of you, yes, and you're just like, oh, there's these 20 things I had been throwing in a box, these ideas for 10 years straight, mm -hmm. things that I just didn't have the time to do, didn't have the bandwidth to do, and it's such a gift to open that box and say, you know, what was the thing I was obsessed with that I couldn't get around to? Mm -hmm. And to just feel myself as a writer stretching in all these different directions mm -hmm. and knowing that I could go for it. I mm -hmm. can go for it, yeah. right? I think that is the gift of mm -hmm. having made the first sort of big thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have to ask, as I do all artists, because I know there always is work that is happening what have you been working on? What what might be next? So I am a little religious about not saying okay. exactly. No, you don't say exactly, but just even in mm -hmm. a sense of, as you said, you were many ideas were happening mm -hmm. while this was happening. So simply that perhaps, can you talk about what your work life is now as you consider? new ideas. You know, it's great because I am I'm I'm thinking a lot about the act of journeying, mm -hmm. being a sojourner mm -hmm. in the world, being a wanderer in a moment when we can't wander very much. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so taken with this idea and I'm I'm back to my four AM. When I start waking up at four AM then, then whatever was an idea is mm -hmm. something very real for me because for mm -hmm. when I'm thinking and I have the most clarity. Wow. Um, so I'm 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 doing my 4 a.m. writerly schedule, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's like a sentence, you know. But I'm sort of in the beginning of mm -hmm. making this new world, which is mm -hmm. really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm imagining that's possible because you created something so powerful and so brilliant and so complete, right? The world that you conjure, the world that you represented in its reality, but all the worlds that you conjure here, the histories, the memories, the sense of all of the individuals, your family, but also the world that they represent um, is such a gift. It's a gift, I think, to them, but it's really a gift to us because you know, as I say, the act that you created by giving us this sense of this story as representative of so many things, its power is important, but also the sense of possibility mm. that's that. there in the language, the beauty of your language is truly, truly, truly fantastic. Thank so you. I want to thank you for thank that. You. And really, thank you for this conversation. I know everyone joins me. If we if we were in a room, I know we would be hearing an applause for you. So oh, I will you. I will applaud and just you know thank you 
for this excellent conversation. And I wanna say to our fantastic audience, thank you all for being here. I mean, we can't see you, but I know Sarah probably feels as I do your presence uh, through the screen. And I want to say, if you haven't already done so, please go to Bunch of Grapes or your local bookstore and buy The Yellow House, now in paperback. If you already have a copy, buy another as a gift because it is a gift and everyone who you give it to will, will love it. That has been my experience. And many thanks to our audience for joining us for this launch event of the 2020 Martha's Vineyard Author Series. This Sunday, August 2nd, we'll bring Eric Larson and Amor Tolls to the MV Author Series. You can register online at Crowdcast to join. Stay well, buy the book through the link on your screen, and keep reading. Good evening, everyone. And Thank you all for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thelma. Thank you.